I want to speak tonight for just a little while out of the book of Acts. For several months, I've been bringing a series of messages on the life of the Apostle Paul. And uh, I broke away for a couple of weeks to talk to us about some other things. But uh, I want to come back to this thought this evening. Uh, There's so much to be said about Saul of Tarsus, uh, who, as a result of his conversion, had his name changed. You know, when we have conversion, we have our names written in heaven. The Bible's clear about that. They came back to Jesus one day, the disciples, and said, why, even the devils are subject unto us. And he said, don't you rejoice because the devils are subject unto you, but you rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And we're grateful tonight uh, that salvation brings about a change. We've been looking at this, and we've been learning from the life of Saul and Paul some illustrations of how we are affected Uh, When we get saved, some practical applications and illustrations in the life of this great man. I'm reading tonight in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 11. And I begin reading in verse number 19. And when I finalize this reading, I will be moving back momentarily for a few minutes to the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. But my text verse for a few minutes, verses found in Acts chapter 11 and verse number 19. The Bible says, as Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travailed or traveled as far as Phoenicia's and Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, and for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Lord, I thank you for these wonderful passages of Scripture. And now guide us tonight and instruct us through thy word. Because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a very important phrase here that I want to call to our attention for just a moment. It's found in verse number 26. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Antioch was a very wicked city. But the gospel delivered them from the darkness of sin unto the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to the extent that the city of Antioch, if you'll move over in your Bibles for just a moment, that 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 the church of Antioch became the place of missionary endeavor. This is very interesting. 
In chapter number 13, the Apostle Paul is launching out now on his first missionary journey. And in verse number 1 of chapter number 13, now these were in, uh, now there was in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas and and uh, Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein I have called them. It was at this place, Antioch, where they were first called Christians, that the Holy Spirit separated Paul to the mission field. It, this was the place that he went out from. This was the place that he reported back to. If you'll notice in your Bibles, uh, in chapter number 14, verse number 26, the Bible says, and from thence they sailed to Antioch. Now this is at the close of their first missionary journey. They go back to Antioch, the place they were sent out from, the place where the Holy Spirit said, separate me unto this ministry. And in 1426, and thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Now I bring this to our attention first of all tonight before I actually get into the message. Because Antioch became a great evangelistic center. As a matter of fact, the church had its beginning in Jerusalem. But they decided to settle down in Jerusalem. So through a certain order of events, Antioch experiences a great revival. A great revival to the extent that it becomes the city of missionary endeavor. They go out from there. They come back to that city. And there's a great illustration here of how missionaries are to function when they are sent out from a church. Here at Berean, we're grateful to have missionaries that we help support in a lot of different places. They have a responsibility to report back to the sending church. And we, we understand that truth because of the 14th chapter of the book of Acts. They went out from Antioch. In verse number 26, they returned to Antioch. And in verse number 27, they rehearsed all that God had done for them. We think it's important, should there be missionaries listening tonight, we think it's important. We think it's important because it's scriptural. We think it's important because it's biblical. If a church helps in the support of a missionary to the missionary field, then missionary has a moral responsibility, an obligation to stay in touch with those churches who make it possible for them to carry the gospel to the different fields uh, around the world. And they are to be in touch by, by letter are on furlough to come by their supporting churches and to bring the churches up to date uh, pertaining to their ministry on the mission fields. I know here at Berean, we occasionally will have a missionary or two that we may go six months. And in one instance, I remember we went over a year and did not hear from the field. And I sent them a letter and I shared with him this great truth here in the book of Acts. And that if we did not hear from them, that we would recommend to our church that we no longer support them because they had a moral obligation to report back to the church that sent them out. 
So Antioch be becomes a great evangelistic center, replacing the city of Jerusalem as the place that God is now using to the extent they were so much like the Lord Jesus Christ that they were called Christians. First, at Antioch. That simply means that the people in the city of Antioch, as they observed these people who had made professions of faith, they said, well, they're acting just like Jesus. And so as a result of that, they said, well, they're Christians. They're Christ-like. And that's the way it ought to be. That when an individual trusts Christ as their Savior. Now let's get down tonight to our lesson here in the book of Acts as we back up to the ninth chapter and we begin our study there. Now some wonderful things has happened in the life of Saul of Tarsus. Saul has met the Lord on the Damascus Road. He thought he was in the light until he got into the light. When he got into the true light, he realized he'd been walking in darkness. And he accepted the true light, the light of Jesus Christ as his Savior. And my, what a difference. What a life-changing event took place when Saul met the Lord Jesus Christ. Look in your Bibles, please, in Acts chapter 9 and verse number 21. Notice, please, what the Scriptures teach us about the change in the life of Saul of Tarsus. The Bible in 921 says, but all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them, which called on uh, this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? They recognized Something has transformed the life of Saul of Tarsus. They couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe the change that had been wrought in his life. You know, the Bible's clear. No change, no salvation. The Bible's very clear that when we meet Christ, we're turned out of darkness into light. That's a change. That's a drastic change. The Bible reminds us that if we're saved, we've had two births. The first birth is the birth that introduces us to this world. And the first birth is a, is a birth which is a revelation of the Adamic nature. Uh, we're born the first time as a result of of the fallen humanity of Adam. In Adam all sin. But when we have the second birth, we're born from above. And we're to have the nature of Christ. And we're to have the Holy Spirit of Christ. No one can ever convince me that there's not a change that's wrought when that event takes place. That first birth connects us to this lost world. That, that fallen spirit in humanity, like a magnet, reaches out and craves for the nature of this old lost world. But when we get saved, we have a divine nature. And the divine nature that God puts in us is a nature that reaches out and is not satisfied with the leeks and the onions and the garlic of this world. It's only satisfied and it can only be satisfied when it's conformed to the divine image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody years ago said it this way, there is an image in the soul, the divine soul of the human creation that's in the shape of God. And the only thing that can feel that need and that longing is for God to feel that shape. And that is exactly right. This world is seeking those of us who are saved are possessors. While they're still seeking something to make them happy, we've got happiness residing in us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit and the divine nature he has placed within us. And when Saul got saved, they said, is this the same guy? 
I'm sure some of these people had stood on the sidewalks and they had observed Saul as he brings Christians with their, maybe their hands tied behind their back down the streets of the city to lock them up and to take their lives. And now he has identified with the crowd he's been persecuting. Now he's identifying with the Christ that he denied. And rightly so, and naturally, they're looking at him. They said, is this not the person that used to be taking these Christians and putting them in jail? Is not this the person that used to be blaspheming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? So he's got saved. And when people get saved, the world takes notice. And if the world is not able to take notice that something's changed in our lives, then we need to back up and check to see if we really got to Calvary or not. Because Calvary changes us and resurrection changes us and makes us new creatures in Christ. So Paul, Saul was changed. But it's amazing that when Saul got uh, changed and met the master, that, that two groups, two different groups of people now look at him with suspect. Let's look at it in our Bibles for just a moment. Look at Acts chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. First of all, we find those that used to praise him now want to kill him. Isn't that amazing? In Acts chapter number 9, verse number 23, uh, the Bible says this, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Those of you that are listening to my voice tonight, what if when you had trusted Christ as your Savior, some of those around you said, man, I hate that he or she's done that. I, we ought to just kill them, get them out of their misery. Well, that's what they said about Saul. Wait a minute. These are the people that used to cheer him on. These are the people that used to say, thank you, Paul, for trying to eradicate this name of Jesus. We're so proud of you. And now that he's met Jesus, they want to kill him. They want to take his life. But not only those who were his friends have now become his enemies, but those who were scared to death of him before he got saved, now they're still scared to death of him since he's trusted Christ as his Savior Look at verse number 26 of Acts chapter number 9. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is, uh, is the uh, place where it's all taken place. This is where the Holy Spirit showed up. This is where Jesus told them to wait until they be endued with power from on high. This is the place where when the Holy Spirit came, Peter stood up and preached and 3,000 people walked out and got saved. This is the people where there's some 12, 15 nations present and all of them heard the gospel in their own tongue that day at Pentecost. And this is the place where the gospel was to begin. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. This was the home place of the sending church to the world. But I want you to note, please, this place, this uh, place where the church was supposed to be going forth and Proclaiming the gospel, verse 26, Acts 9, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was, in fact, a disciple. Saul suddenly finds himself in no man's land. The people that were cheering him on are now wanting to kill him. And the people who were afraid of him, afraid he was going to incarcerate them, they are still afraid of him. And you know why they're afraid of him? They're afraid that maybe this is just a false profession. Maybe he don't really mean this. And if we side with him, he will be able to uh, infiltrate us. He'll know who is following the Lord. And we will end up uh, in prison or we will end up with our lives taken from us. So he finds himself now in no man's land. And as a result of all of this, great persecution is taking place in and around Jerusalem. Look with me in Acts chapter 11 and verse number 19 as we turn back over two chapters. Acts 11 and verse number 19. The Bible says, Now they which were scattered abroad. The church is being scattered. 
Now, one reason the church is being scattered is given here in verse number 19, because of the persecution of Stephen and the death of Stephen. But another reason, as you study the book of Acts, this has taken place, is because the disciples, now this is very important, the disciples have settled down at Jerusalem. And Jesus said, you begin there, but you move on out to Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world. You know, the Lord had to send persecution to Jerusalem to get them out of their comfort zone so that they could get the gospel on out to the rest of the world. So that he allowed persecution to come to the church of Jerusalem and to some of the followers in the church of Jerusalem to scatter them out. The word scattered there was a word that comes from a word that means to scatter the seed, to sow the seed. So they're leaving Jerusalem and they're going out with the gospel. And persecution is driving them out there so that other people may hear the good news of the gospel of the Son of God. God has ways of doing things. I, I don't understand what's going on right now to the fullest extent. But God knows what's going on right now. God has a purpose. And God has a plan. And someday we'll know it. It could very well be that God's trying to get the attention of our nation. I do know this, that people's hearts are still hard. I know uh, one of the Christian businessmen here in our country was with our president on yesterday. You've watched him advertise on television, My Pillow. The man is a born again Christian. And he took to the microphone for a few minutes and said a few things. And then he looked over to the president. He said, You mind if I say a few other things? And he gave him leave to do so. And he gave a great testimony about Christ. And he made, uh, in his testimony, he said, we, as we're going home and closing ourselves in, we need to get our Bibles out. And we need to start reading. Many of the major news uh, bureaus since then have made fun of him that he would take that platform and dare to talk about Jesus Amen. and dare to talk about the Bible. Now, as long as America which at this point has been put on its knees, continues to make fun of the Bible and to make fun of the Lord Jesus Christ, he may continue the pressure. He may have to take us off of our knees and put our face down in the dirt to get our attention. Of all of the help that we're getting in Washington, and I'm thankful for everything everybody's trying to do, but everybody's exhausting their efforts and the numbers are still increasing. The only person that has the ability to turn this thing around and salvage us economically and morally and spiritually, the only individual in the universe that can do that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the book of Chronicles, he told us how to do it. If my people, which are called by my name, he said, if the day comes and your crops uh, dry up in the field and you don't have any cattle in the stall, and he said, when the finances are gone, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. You say, that's an Old Testament truth. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And Genesis 1-1 is as much a part of the Word of God as Revelation 22. I'm, I'm just here at 21. I'm here to tell you this evening that the Word of God still speaks to us tonight. And America would be well to listen to what our Lord is trying to get us to understand. And we have that illustration here. These believers were scattered. Persecution came to give out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse number 19, the Bible says that they were scattered. And one of the cities here mentioned is they were scattered as far as Antioch. Now, I want to tell you just a little bit about this city. I talked to us about it a while ago. Very interesting. It became, it became the established place where they first called Christians. It became the place where the first missionary effort had its beginning. But this city was not always a place where they were called Christians. This was one of the most wicked cities of that era. Historians tell us that it was probably more wicked than Rome. And Rome was a wicked city. Historians tell us that this city was filled with gross immorality. They had a temple there. 
in the city of Antioch, they had what was called temple prostitution, where people would go in this temple, and it was a place of nothing more than prostitution in the city of Antioch. It was a city of half a million people, stooped in sin, debauchery, and shame. And yet the power of the gospel in that city of darkness illuminated their darkened souls to the extent they cried out to Jesus for mercy. And they were many, were many, many of them were wonderfully and gloriously saved to the extent they began to be called Christians first in the city of Antioch. What does America need tonight? America needs the same truth that Antioch received. And that's the truth of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes the gospel and the gospel only to change the hearts of fallen humanity. But you know what's so wonderful about going into this awful city of wickedness? These people came there under these awful described circumstances. But it's very interesting when they went there, the persecution and the sin in the city did not change their witness. They went in there fervently determined to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the first people they witnessed to in chapter 11, verse number 19, were the Jews. Look in eleven nineteen, if you will. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word, watch this, to none, but unto the Jews only. They're going out across the countryside. What's, what are the Jews doing? Well, they're still offering sacrifices. They're still trying to keep the law. We're not under the law anymore here in Acts chapter 11. We're under grace. Law brings us to conversion, but it has no power to convert us. It takes the grace of God to change a darkened heart and a darkened soul. So they're going out and they're preaching the gospel to the Jews. They were, uh, because it was the Jews who gave us the Bible. It was the Jews who gave us the Savior. And the Jews of all people should not be a group of people blinded. They should be the people who are accepting the Messiah but they, they are rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting the message of the cross. And the disciples and the followers from the church of Jerusalem, they're going everywhere, but especially to the Jews, and they're preaching Jesus unto them. But not only them, they're preaching Jesus to the Gentiles. Look at verse 21 of Acts chapter number 11. The Bible said, and it's talking about the cities in verse number 20, uh, Cyprus and Cyrene and Antioch. The Bible said in verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, and turned unto the Lord. So watch what's happening. They're preaching the gospel now to the Jews. They're preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And uh, the Bible says that a great number of people are getting saved. Where are they getting saved at? In these cities of weakness and darkness. My friend, you can't improve on the gospel. All across this nation, it is not from the pulpit that U.S. News and World Report needs to be proclaimed. We need the gospel proclaimed as the only means available to change the wicked hearts of the lost, fallen race of humanity. And they went to these cities. And I want you to notice what they did. And this blesses me. And I hope it blesses you when I show it to you. Because the means that they used to win the Jews to Christ and the means that they used to win the Gentiles to Christ is the major means today that brings people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Twice in verse 19, verses 19 and 20, there are words that I have uh, circled in my Bible. I don't want to miss them because this is how I got to Jesus. Look at verse number 19 down towards the last of the verse. It says, and Antioch, preaching the word to none other but unto the Jews. Only. Look at the word there. They went there preaching. Look in verse number 20 at the latter part of it. After they went to Cyprus and Cyrene, they came to Antioch. They spake unto the Grecians. Look at this word. They came there preaching. 
What happened when they preached in Antioch? People got saved. What happened when they preached at Cyrena? People got saved. What happened when they went out from Jerusalem and they preached? People got saved. What do people need to hear today? First of all, and most important, what people need to hear today is the preaching of the good news of the gospel. The gospel means the good news. There's a lot of bad news, but the good news is Jesus Christ will save and Jesus Christ will cleanse and Jesus Christ Christ will purify a darkened soul and bring them out of darkness into life and give them a second birth from above which can transform their lives. As we say in my Sunday school class when we meet, amen, Amen. Preaching is important. I stand in this pulpit on this Wednesday night in 2020, the result of preaching, faithful preaching of my pastor's. Through their message, I heard about the good news and I trusted Christ. I'm sure there are many people listening to me right now who are saved. You got saved through preaching. Not everybody does, but more people do. Sometimes it's personal soul winning one-on-one in people's homes and in the marketplace and wherever they work. But uh, more people are saved through preaching. If the message is right, people can get saved and people ought to want to get saved. But the good news is it's through the preaching. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? The Bible said, Bible said, God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them who will believe. Not foolish preaching, but the Bible said God chose through the foolishness of preaching. To the world the message makes no sense at all but to the person who's under conviction and they're ready to cry out for mercy it means much to them that they can be delivered from the shackles and the chains of sin. Preaching. Well as they go preaching what's the message they preach? Look at Acts chapter 11 and verse number 20 we have the message. The Bible said, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrena, which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians, look at this, preaching the Lord Jesus. There's the message. What is the message? What is it that changes a heart and a life? What is it that makes old, old creations new creations? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. Jesus is the Savior of the world. I received an email this week, this past week, about a uh, program on our radio station. It's not a local program. And uh, they had an individual that was going to be speaking on that particular program that talks about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They believe the only way you can be saved is by keeping the seven sacraments. Uh, And what is so amazing to me is that after you keep the seven sacraments, which itself uh, should enable us to understand if you have to keep sacraments, what was the purpose of Jesus coming? I, we're not saved by keeping sacraments. But what, is, what really blows my mind is that even in this religious denomination, when you have the seven sacraments, you still have to go to purgatory to get cleansed. So not only do they not believe Jesus only can do it, they don't even believe their own works can do it, the seven sacraments, because when you die, then you've got to go to purgatory and get purged before you can go into heaven. There's something wrong with that picture. Especially when the Bible said, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't say might be, could be, ought to be, he said shall be saved. We believe when we call upon the name of Jesus, we acknowledge to him that we're sinners and invite him by faith to become our Savior and come into our heart. For uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Uh, Jesus is the means 
of salvation, period, without anything being added or tacked on to it. And the message here in the book of Acts that they're preaching out from Jerusalem, the message, the message they are preaching is the message of Jesus. And if you study the New Testament throughout the writings of Saul of Tarsus, who's now Paul, it's about Jesus. He gives us the definition of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I, give, I, I, I share with you, I give unto you that which I also receive, how that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and on the third day he was raised again according to the scriptures. In Romans chapter 1, the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. The gospel, not kissing the statue of a toe, the gospel, not keeping the catechism, the gospel, not praying through Mary, the gospel, not going, going through what is called in this world an infallible head, but going through the infallible head who sits on the right hand of the Father. His name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now what happens when you preach the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles and you preach Jesus to them? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Look at 1121. The Bible said that the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Uh, look again in verse number 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost, talking about Barnabas, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. How'd this come about? Through the preaching of Jesus Christ. They're getting saved, and multitudes of people are added unto the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. And then we see in Acts chapter 11, verse number 22, I want you to watch this. Tidings of these things came to the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. Tidings of what things? Jews are getting saved. Gentiles are getting saved. As my old preacher used to say, that's winds. Weans are getting saved. We Gentiles are getting saved. Jews are getting saved. And the word is spreading. Do you know when there's a fire burning, people go to see what's happening? You hear the fire truck, you see those fire trucks, they call them fire truck chasers. There's something, I don't know why it is, there's something exciting about seeing people's houses burn down evidently. Or their cars catch on fire. And they see the fire truck go down the road and they chase the fire truck to see where they're going. Everybody, they see the sky light up at night and they say, there's a fire over there. Wonder where that's at. They get in their car and they drive to see where the fire's at. When the church is on fire, people will drive to see what's happening. That's the reason we want our church to be on fire spiritually. So people will drive out to see where the fire's coming from. It happened here. I like the story that uh, was told about a church that caught on fire. And that was back when they had the bucket brigade and didn't have fire trucks. And they had a group of people dipping water and putting it in a bucket and hand it from person to person to person to person till they throw the water on the fire to church. And the village atheist was in the line uh, handing the bucket from one person to another. And one of the Christians said, uh, strange to see you here handing buckets of water to put the church uh, fire out. He said, well, it's the first time the church had been on fire. May that never be said about our church that it's not on fire. May this church be on fire. But that's an individual decision. We can't wait for somebody else to get on fire. That's something that we ought to desire individually. Lord, set me on fire spiritually and let the world look at me and let me burn for you that the world can say, like they said at Antioch, they were called Christians because they were so much like Jesus. Word gets back to Jerusalem, and I'm finishing. Word gets back to Jerusalem in verse number 22. That the tidings of these things are happening and uh, the word got to Jerusalem. Man, you apostles over here, you've sat down, you're not doing anything, but I want you to know this fire is burning outside Jerusalem. Over here at Antioch and in the surrounding countryside, things is happening out there. I want you to know that. So the Jerusalem, uh, the I like to call them the muckety mucks, the disciples that didn't leave out of Jerusalem, they're sitting up there feasting on their blessed assurance. And they're not doing what Jesus said when he said, launch out. 
And, and so the persecution comes, and they're sending them out. Now people are getting saved, uh, and word gets back to them. And so they say, well, let's get, send, by, send somebody over there. Let's see if this is real or not. So in verse number 22, they sent Barnabas over to Antioch. And they wanted him to go, to look, go over there and look to see what was happening and to report back to them. And that's the next message the next time that the Lord tarries is coming. And Barnabas went to Antioch. And there are five characteristics in the life of Barnabas that we should seek to emulate. I'll give them to you next time. If the rapture takes place, and anybody listening to my voice misses it, my notes are in my Bible, you can come and look them up. But the good news is, the bottom line is, and all has been said tonight, when a person comes face to face with Jesus Christ, a transformation takes place in their lives. It's right here. You can't miss it. Father, we thank you tonight for loving us. Thank you tonight for these great examples that you've left us here to follow. And I ask you this evening, Lord, to speak to our heart through these illustrations. And help us to apply these truths to our lives. And we'll thank you for it because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.